Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar with Belvoir Group PLC, hosted by Yellowstone Advisory. We're delighted to have with us today CEO Dorian Consalves and CFO Louise George. And I'd now like to hand over to Dorian to start today's presentation. Thank you very much for the um, for the kind intro introduction and um, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, as Alex said, the the format is that um, we're going to run through a presentation for for sort of thirty to forty minutes. The presentation includes a brief introduction to um, to the team, um, the key highlights of our full year um, twenty twenty two, which we announced to the market on the twenty seventh of March. So it's not quite hot off the press, but it's you know fairly hot off the press. Um, Louise will cover um, some financials in the middle of the presentation, and then I'll come back and talk about the operation and the three markets that we operate in. Um, and as Alex rightly said, we'll then open up to, um, to questions after sort of 30 to 40 minutes. Um, so first of all, onto the, uh, onto the first slide. Um, very brief introduction. Um, as Alex said, my name is Dorian. Um, I've been with Belvoir for um, 18 full years. I've just come into my 19th year. Um, I've spent 25 years in the property sector, which is almost half of my life. I'm sort of 49 um, the week after next. So I'm getting, I'm getting I'm, in fact, it's more than half, half of my life. And um, key skills, franchising, people management, um, and, um, and and property. You know, we're very passionate about what we do. Um, and, and I think, you know, we're very good at what we do. Um, I do have shares in the business and the shareholdings on the screen um, and also have share options which are attached to uh, to an LT longer term. Um, Louise, 20 plus years experience on, on, on AIM listed companies, um, joined us nine years ago. Um, it's been quite interesting nine years. Uh, nine years ago, we only had one brand. That was just the Belvoir brand. And we were residential lettings specialists. We didn't do anything else, just lettings. Um, we, we've, um, over the last sort of eight or nine years, we've expanded out into financial services, estate agency, and one or two other sort of services, which we'll explain through the uh, through the presentation. Um, Louise also has shares in the business. Um, the, the, it's around 5% of the, the company is in management hands, um, about 40 plus percent um, retail hands, and around 50% in the hands of institutions, just in case that sort of preempts a, a question. Um, our ticker is BLV. We floated in 2012, and I, I was the CEO when we floated. Um, current market cap um, is 77 million. We've had quite a quite a good response to our results. Um, I think our share price is up by um, 22, 23%. Um, you know, since our results uh, were announced, um, Q4 last year was quite tough for for property businesses. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty, but I think those clouds have started to dissipate somewhat. And um, I think it's fair to say that a lot of companies now are feeling more optimistic about the uh, the sort of outlook going forward, which I'll I'll explain um, later on. So the business itself, um, some of you may be familiar with the business, some of you may not, so I'll just give you a quick run through. Um, I mean, at the heart of, of our business, we um, we operate in three distinct areas. So we operate in residential lettings. So we manage properties on behalf of landlords. Typically, um, a, a typical client of, of, of Belvoir, for example, um, is someone who owns one, two, three, four, five properties. They don't want to be involved in all of the day-to-day -day management. Um, they don't want to be bothered at three o'clock in the morning when, um, when when there's a leak in a property. So that type of landlord approaches us. We take on management and we do pretty much everything um, on the landlord's behalf. They don't have to worry about regulation, licensing, management of the tenant, nothing at all. We do it all for them, normally in return for um, around 10% of the, of, of the, of the rental um, income. Um, so across our brands, um, Belvoir is very much a, a, a residential lettings business. 90% of its revenue that the franchisees generate comes from lettings. That's exactly the same in Northwood. Um, so 250 of our franchises specialise in residential lettings and they do a little bit of estate agency and financial services. Um, Newton Fallowell and Lavelle are primarily estate agency businesses. Um, they are they operate within Lincolnshire, West Midlands, and the East Midlands, so the middle middle belt of the the country. Um, we do very little in London, so more than ninety percent of our revenue is derived from outside of the M25, just to give you an idea of, of geography. And then Mr. and Mrs. Clark is a small business we invested in last year, and we acquired one hundred percent of the share capital. 
Paul and Alex Clark are still running that business. Um, we employ them, and um, and it, it's our first foray into home run estate agency. So it's a estate agency without a shop. Um, all of the other um, brands operate from retail units. So Belvoir, Newton, Fallowell, Northwood, Lavelle and Humphreys all operate from retail units or commercial offices. The last brand I have mentioned is Humphreys, which is a student lettings business. Um, so in terms of our gross profit split across across these, these businesses, around 60% of our gross profit comes from um, residential lettings. Around 20% comes from financial services and around 20% comes from estate agency. Point being that we are underpinned by recurring revenue that is generated um, from the management of 75,000 properties, which are spread all over the uh, the UK. And we do cover Scotland, we do cover Northern Ireland, and we uh, we also have offices in Wales. On the right hand side of the screen, um, we, we, we started to, to become involved in financial services in 2017. It was a strategic move. We bought a small financial services business in 2017. And um, we've grown that business part organically and part by acquisition um, from a small business into a, an advisor base of 284 mortgage advisors. Um, it's now quite a significant business. Um, we are Mortgage Advice Bureau's biggest customer, really. That's the best way to describe it. And we have a, a, a license arrangement with Mortgage Advice Bureau where we use their systems, website, access to lenders, infrastructure, training in return for a portion of the commission that our advisors generate. So we have a you know a partnership arrangement with Mortgage Advice Bureau. Um, okay, so that's hopefully just a bit of colour around the business itself. Um, so Mr. and Mrs. Clark, I won't spend too much time on, but it's a, you know, it's a new business. Um, we are looking to sort of expand this out um, in the future. Um, and it's a home run estate agency model. I think one question that we had um, um, before the, the presentation was around the investment level in Mr. and Mrs. Clark. Um, it isn't a great deal. So we have earmarked around 125,000 uh, of investment in Mr. and Mrs. Clark this year. So it is a small business. We know that. And, um, um, and what, you know, we'll, we'll keep sort of, you know, growing that business going forward. It's 100% franchised. Um, the Time Group is a, is a mortgage business that we, um, we bought last year. Um, in terms of acquisitions, we have acquired six property businesses. So on the previous screen, I mentioned those. They were Northwood, Newton Fallowell, um, Lavelle, Humphreys, and, and a small one that was integrated into Newton Fallowell. And so we've, we've acquired six property type businesses. Um, and we have acquired four financial services businesses. Um, the, the four financial services businesses, we, we have spent around 10 million on these four businesses. They've generated about, since we bought them in 2017 um, and beyond, um, they've generated about nine and a half million of EBITDA since, um, since we bought these businesses. Um, and you know, if we if we keep seeing opportunities like uh, like these, we will continue to buy them. And on the screen here, um, it just gives you a, a, a an idea of what these businesses look like. So we acquired a business with a revenue of four point two million, profit before tax of 0.7 million up until July twenty one, um, total consideration of four point one, um, and and it added in twenty twenty two, it added two point seven of revenue and 0.4 million of profit during seven months. Um, we have got opportunities this year to to acquire you know further FS businesses, and um, we're very cash generative. We finished um, the year for the first time since two thousand and fifteen in a net cash position. Um, and, you know, I'm quite regularly asked about you know what what do we intend to do with our cash. Well, we'll we will keep a, a watchful eye on our sort of dividend policy. We we have got a progressive dividend policy. Dividend was up six percent last year. But on top of that, we are generating cash at a, you know quite a quick rate. Um, but at the moment, we do have you know possible opportunities that if we can do some more deals this year, we will. Um, any acquisitions that we sort of you know that we put together this year are not already in our numbers, so that would be you know a, a new addition. The third part of the slide, um, we also help our franchisees to acquire businesses, and we've helped. Um, so and what that looks like is, um, let's say we've got a franchisee in Peterborough with a good business. Um, we help the franchisee in Peterborough to find uh, a lettings business that may be suitable to purchase. And we make the approach if the franchisee wants us to. Um, we help put the deal together. We help fund the deal. Um, and then we can help operationally if the franchisee needs some assistance. These deals are very profitable. 
for both the franchisee and for the franchisor. Um, and last year, we completed on a number of these deals, which added about 300,000 of extra management service fee um, to, to our business. Um, the, the graph on the screen is just showing that pre-COVID, um, we'd got up to uh, levels of six to 700,000 pounds worth of extra franchise revenue coming into us from these acquisitions. It dropped off in 2020, dropped off in 2021. That therefore had an impact on 2022 because we didn't see the benefit of these acquisitions last year. But the good news is last year that we, um, we, we've we increased our numbers of acquisitions. And so far this year, um, we're, we're on track to, to perform better again um, in terms of franchisee acquisitions. So they're going really well. Um, we, we do those acquisitions internally. I've got a team of people, um, a team of five, who work on these acquisitions full time. Okay. So a few highlights before I pass across to Louise. Um, if you haven't seen our numbers, um, revenue was up 14%, 33.7 million. Um, profit before tax was down 2% to 9.1 million compared with 2021. Um, if you follow the property market, you will know that 2021 was an extraordinary year for the sector. So it was always going to be very difficult to um, to have another 2021. Um, you know, we didn't have another stamp duty holiday. We didn't have the frenzy um, post COVID. Um, we exceeded, exceeded market expectations, interestingly, in the COVID year of 2020. Um, and 2021 was another good year for us. So we knew the market would, would normalize. But actually, to get pretty close to that, I thought was a you know a good good result. Um, cash flow from operations ten point eight million, um, and I mentioned earlier that we finished the year net cash. Previous year, we finished the year one point three million of net debt. Um, we do have a facility if we we need one, um, and um, you know we we suspect that for acquisitions that we may be looking at this year, and um, we may not need a, a sort of larger facility. But you know if we we. Um, we don't have an issue with carrying debt if if we find the right opportunities. Um, I suspect that we're generating enough cash to not need a, a facility this year. Um, we're now operating in 487 locations, which is up 14%, and the number of mortgage advisors is up 17%, mainly from the acquisition of time. Um, property sales last year across our business um, got up to... Um, it's at 10,970. So that was an 11% decrease on 2021. So the market um, saw lots more transactions in 2021 compared with a normal year. And it's it's essentially returning to uh, return to normal in 2022. Um, what underpins us, as I mentioned at the beginning, is our recurring revenue, which comes from managing properties on behalf of landlords. And it's great to see that our managed portfolio continues to grow each year. We're now up to 75,500 managed residential units. Okay, so off to Luis, for, over to Luis for, uh, for one or two slides, and I'll come back and talk about the market. Okay, just to say that um, there's some detailed um, slides in the appendices which cover the balance sheet and the cash flow, but um purpose of this um, presentation, I'll talk through the income statement here. So our, our revenue is up 14% to 33.7 million. Um, our, we operate, as John's explained, through two divisions, um, the property franchise division and financial services. So the property revenue was up 2% to 15.6 million. And um, what we saw, if you like, on the um, like for like, the organic growth, we saw 4% like for like growth in lettings and 17% growth in franchise fees um, offset the reduction of 15% in property sales. So overall, our sort of like for like growth was um, was effectively zero, um, but we were able to make up that shortfall on, on property sales, which was good. Um, the 2% increase came in growth came from the net effect of our acquisitions and disposals. I want to say disposals, we just had a, a, um, a corporate owned office that we'd acquired when we'd bought the Nicholas Humphreys network that we'd actually franchised out, so we no longer owned it directly. Um, on the financial services side, um, revenue was up 26% to 18.1 million. Um, and within that, there was 4% growth arose from like for like growth and 22% was from um, acquisitions. Um, and that was mainly the acquisition of time mortgage services at the end of May last year. At a gross profit level, you can see that we're up 6% to 20.3 million. So the, obviously a different level of, of increase to the revenues. And this is because um, 
between when you compare financial services to the property division, the financial services has a very different journey from revenue to gross profit. So on the property side, 100% of our revenue dropped straight through into gross profit. On the financial services side, we see quite a significant pay away in commission to advisors who've, who've written the mortgage business and also um, to um, introducers, um, estate agents, et cetera, who have um, introduced a lead to the advisor. So broadly, um, about 26% of revenue drops through to gross profit on the um, financial services side. But as a result, as financial services has comprised a larger proportion of our total revenue, that means that when you look at the overall gross margin, it's gone down from 64 to 60%. And you'll probably also notice that the margin on the financial services revenue has gone down from 27 to 26. So this is because when we bought the time network, um, that came with virtually entirely um, all the advisors that moved across were self-employed advisors. So in the main, most of our um, mortgage advisors are self-employed, but we do have a cohort of about 40 employed advisors. Um, they, we tend to have a, there's more overhead associated with supporting the employed advisors in terms of um, admin teams to progress the mortgages. On the self-employed advisor side, they tend to run their own business, they do their own progress tracing, and they're, they're, they're much lighter in terms of the footprint on our, on our overheads. We always think of our self-employed advisors much more like our franchise model where they're running their own business and we're providing business development support. So from our point of view, we actually quite like the, um, the self-employed model. That's that's kind of what un underpins the franchising part of our business. Um, so, But it does mean that when you're looking at different years, you will see the gross profit margin on financial services go down, but then we don't have the overhead subsequently. Um, so overall, um, our net profit was down just 2%, which when you know we make the comparison to 2021 being such a good year for a state agency, um, you know, that was a, a, a effectively a well-managed result. Um, and in actual fact, our profit after tax was marginally ahead. Um, and just a final point on this side, our dividend um, for 2022 is up 6 cents to 9 pence, and um, we're paying out the second tranche of the dividend this month. Um, this slide is aimed at trying to give a bit of a, um, a big picture view of how we've grown um, since we floated in 2012, um, both through um, acquisition and also through diversification. So back in 2012, 2012, sorry, 2012, as Dorian said, um, it was just we were just operating Belvoir. It was just a single brand, and it, and we only did lettings, and that's the red bars, as you can see how they've moved. Um, we then started a bit of a pilot on um, doing estate agency and property sales, and that's the green bars. Um, that started to ramp up in 2015. So in 2015, we started our multi-brand um, franchise um, strategy. We acquired a business called Newton Fallowell that's very that they were based in the um, in the Midlands, and they that was predominantly a state agency that came with it with a little bit of financial services. Um, we built that up further on the financial services side when we acquired Brook Financial Services in 2017 and, and, and two or three other financial services businesses thereafter. So you can see how the, the dark blue line has, has increased. So if we go back to 2014, which was our last year just operating as Belvoir, um, gross profit was 6.5 million. In the eight years since then to 2022, gross profit increased by 13.8 million. That was up 212% to 20.3 million. So if I look at the gross profit of the businesses that we acquired as at the time when we acquired them, um, they would have contributed growth of 9.7 million to gross profit over that period. And the organic growth over that period um, was 4.1 million. So the organic growth was 63% over those, that, those years. Um, and I think, um, I can't recall if Don mentioned it earlier or not, but um, we've, we've actually invested um, about 10 million in our financial services businesses that required, and that's contributed 15.7 million in gross profit. Um, just a final slide from me, and this is on our ESG strategy. We spent a lot of time putting that in place in 2021 and, and started to work on our, over 2022, started to progress on the R5 pillars that we'd identified. Um, in our latest 
survey of our staff, 85% of staff said that they were proud to work for Belvoir. Um, so Doi and I are trying to work out who the other 15% are and what we can do to make them feel happy as well. Um, we did during the year roll out some additional staff benefits, which included a MediCash um, cash back scheme, um, birthday leave, which was very popular, um, and a cycle to work scheme. We've launched a new training academy for both franchisees and staff in order to nurture talent within the group. Um, and quite importantly, with, the, with engaged with franchisees on their green agenda. So some of the initiatives that we're rolling out across um, us as a franchise or as a group, and we can then, you know, advise them and roll um, some of our ideas further down into our franchise businesses. Um, and finally, we, we've measured our carbon footprint um, and our aim now is to look at what we can do to reduce our carbon footprint. Um, we aim to become carbon neutral in 2024 and that thereafter we're looking at achieving um, net zero. So if I pass you back to Dorian. That's great. Thanks, Louise. OK, so first of all, I've got um, just a couple of slides on the uh, on the operation itself. And I've got three slides on the uh, on the three different markets that we'll that we operate in. Um, and I'll try and give you some sort of insights on, you know, what's happening with the uh, with the market right now. The, that the market's actually quite difficult to understand what's happening, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and shed some light on that for you. Um, so, firstly, the operation it's, operation itself. Um, so, we now have th 338 franchise territories across the brands that I mentioned um, earlier in the presentation. Um, the average MSF, and MSF stands for management service fee. That's the royalty that we uh, we charge as a franchise. All um, the the royalty fee is is either 10 or 12%, depending on which model you're in. It's 12% of a franchisee's gross revenue. So for every £100 the franchisee generates, um, they pay across to us 10 or £12, pounds, um, which is our royalty in return. They, they keep the lion's share. We take a very small amount, but across a large number of franchises. And um, the average MSF per franchise is now at 34,000. And you can see uh, on the graph there how that increases every year. You know, one of the brilliant things about franchising is that franchisees want to grow their businesses. They absolutely want to, they want better lives, they want better cars, they want to, you know, they, they want to grow their asset. You know, these businesses are, are, are worth something. Um, and that means that we've got driven individuals at the heart of each franchise. So as long as we provide them with the tools, the expertise, the support, the website, the technology to be able to grow their business, the franchisee will take the tools and run with it. You know, that, that's that's one of the, the sort of exciting parts about franchising. Um, so the number of managed properties I touched on earlier, but it's 75,500, and you can see the growth since 2018. Um, the number of house sales kind of grows, um, according to the graph, you know, up to 2021, then falls back a touch um, in 2022, which we predicted would happen. Um, and um, I'll come on to sort of what I think might happen next in the housing market, just in the next couple of slides. Um, another couple of pullouts. Um, we the average revenue per franchised office is three hundred and sixteen thousand per unit. Um, so these are quite small businesses, profitable. Um, generally, they've got three or four staff alongside the franchisee. Um, the, we've got four offices now, exceeding a million of revenue um, each year, with the largest single unit at one point three million. Um, and we've got sixteen franchisees who have got small kind of little branch networks of two or three offices who are exceeding a million across these small networks with the largest at 2.1 million, um, which is, you know, again, great result. Um, so 59 franchisees have got two or more offices, 17 have got three or more. The most that a franchisee has got um, is five offices. We've got a couple with uh, a couple with five. Okay, so on, on financial services, just again, a few charts to run through. Um, you can see the growth um, of, of mortgage advisors. So in 2018, it was 123. We're now up to 284. And I suspect, again, this year that we will grow our number of, it's early in the year, but you know, I, I feel that we will grow again in terms of advisor numbers this year. Um, Net Financial Services Commission, again, has grown every year. Um, you can see the growth since 2018. Um, last year, we wrote 18,329 mortgages, which was up 11% on the previous year. 
Um, you know, we well, as mentioned earlier that it was quite tough in Q4 on the financial services side. You know, we can't hide from that. It was a difficult time for a few months. Um, but actually, you, there are millions of people who didn't fix their mortgage deals in Q4 last year, um, who are either starting to fix their deals this year, or they're waiting for interest rates to kind of top out and fall back. Um, but we will um, I, you know, I, I personally think that all of those people will, will still go out and fix their mortgage. It's just a matter of timing rather than a, a lost opportunity. Um, so um, and what we're seeing across our mortgage division is um, we're seeing heightened activity now in the last month or so, which is great. Um, what we've done with sort of a state agency and, and, and FS in our numbers is that we've we've taken about 20 percent off our off our profit in terms of um, FS and the state agency this year. That may prove to have been too pessimistic, but at the end of Q4, we, we felt quite pessimistic, you know, with the, the goings on and, and interest rates rising in one thing or another. Um, in Q4, it was forecast that interest rates would continue to rise and, and could rise quite significantly. Um, the, the most up-to-date forecasts now are that bank rates may have topped out or will top out soon. And if rates start to fall back, you will see heightened activity in the uh, in the property sector. Um, we're seeing quite positive messages coming out of house builders now um, and also from uh, Nationwide have said this week that um, that they're optimistic about the, um, you know, sort of the, the later months of this year. Um, point being that we have um, changed our numbers in terms of, of, of taking some um, some some state agency and FS revenue out. Uh, whether that was too cautious or not is yet to be uh, yet to be seen. So lending from group mortgages three point two billion um, across our business last year. Um, and as I say, we you know we're going to continue to grow this side of the business. Um, we'll actually continue to grow all parts of the business long term. It's not we're not having a particular focus on on one area. I think a question that was sometimes asked is, you know, after we moved away from lettings and got involved in a state agency and FS, was that a good move? Well, the profit contribution contribution from FS, I think, speaks for itself. Um, a state agency, we completely accept. Um, that's a small part of our business and we completely accept that cyclical but ultimately when you've got a good lettings business like we have um lettings is counter cyclical so what i mean is when the when property sales slow down for any for whatever reason um let's say that fewer people buy properties because they can see house prices are falling house prices aren't falling but let's say house prices were falling some buyers might hold back and wait until the market reaches the bottom during that period of holding back normally they rent properties during that period so we see more demand on one side of the business and less demand on another so although estate agencies is cyclical we've got a, a counter cyclical um, part of the business which is residential lettings so on to the the markets um themselves um so the the, the rental market first of all before we announced our results on the 27th of March, I, I saw some pretty rotten reporting um, on where, where journalists were getting confused, I think, between the size of the rental market and the number of available properties to rent. They're two different things. Um, and I saw, you know, some some journalists getting confused and saying that, you know, landlords are exiting the sector, the sector shrinking, the sector isn't shrinking. Um, there is only one measure of the um, size of the private rented sector, and that's ONS. Um, they do, um, they, they put a, a set of data together called the English Housing Survey. Anybody can read it. Um, it goes back a number of years, and the market increased in size, i.e. there are 170,000 more rental properties um, up until the end of March 22, um, compared with the previous year. And if you go back a little bit further, the sector is around the same size as it was back in 2016. So, you know, in 2016, George Osborne announced a raft of changes that disincentivized landlords from joining the sector. Um, landlords haven't exited the sector en masse. People have kept their investments, um, but the sector hasn't grown to meet demand um, and it's demand that's, that that is driving rents up and just to give you an idea of how um, you know what demand looks like at the moment right move are reporting that demand for rental properties is 50 percent higher now than it was pre-pandemic quite significant um, if you want to rent a property you'll probably be up against 10 
to 15 other people who also want to rent that property. So that's not an ideal um, situation for us because we we want to make all of our clients happy. Ultimately, we don't just want to trade with one of them and we'd like to find them all properties if we can. Um, but there is a serious disparity between uh, between supply and demand, which is resulting in much higher rents. And that's the element that is being reported very heavily. Um, so rents are going up in most regions by around 10%. Um, last year, our group revenue from lettings was up 5%, um, part because of rental inflation, part because of acquisition, even though we didn't have many acquisitions in the previous year, um, which, I, which I touched on earlier. What we are seeing now is that rental inflation is starting to make a difference to our lettings revenue. And in, on this slide deck, we say that franchisees are reporting that lettings revenue is up 6% in the first two months of the year. Um, if you include March, it's more like 7%. Um, so we're seeing um, higher growth this year on lettings than we saw last year. Um, people tend to say to me when I, when, I, when I explain that to them, look, you know, what will change? You know, will demand change? Will supply change? Well, on the supply side, I'm not convinced that any party, political party, is brave enough to open their arms and sort of, you know, say landlords flood the market with properties um build to rent um is an area that is growing but although the, the growth of build to rent um has actually reduced um over the last 12 months and it's still a relatively small part of the sector there are, there are as i understand it around 200,000 units um either in the pipeline or built and the size of the private rented sector is 5.2 million units so it's a very small part of the sector but helpful um you know, I think what needs to happen going forward is that the UK just needs to go on a build frenzy, um, both for home to drive home ownership, but also in the rental sector, but also, you know, for, for social housing as well. We've got a dreadful shortage of properties in all three. Um, if the private rented sector is the same size now as it was in 2016, bear in mind that our population has also increased by two million people over that period so you can see what it's, it's obvious where the pressures are coming from and we're now seeing those pressures manifest itself in in higher rents which is not great news for um, the 13 million renters out there so hopefully that shines a bit of a light on the uh, on the rental side of the business uh, residential sales um so we're not really affected by property prices particularly um um Property price growth depends on which index you read. If you read Nationwide, it says one thing. If you read Halifax, it says something else. Um, if you look at ONS, which is pretty, you know, pretty reliable, it's it's slightly out of date. It's normally a month or two out of date. I had a look at ONS this morning, um, and up until the end of February, house prices um, over the previous 12 months had risen by 5.5%, but house price growth is clearly slowing, you know, slowing to somewhere between zero and, and 1%, um, judging by most indexes. Um, the most pessimistic forecast this year were that property prices may fall by 10%. The most optimistic were to fall by 5%. Um, but actually, property that hasn't happened yet. And there's now a question mark, I guess, over whether that will, um, will happen at all, especially on the basis that uh, the mortgage market is becoming you know, pretty competitive again. Um, what we forecast is that we feel, so if you forget house prices for a moment, um, transaction volumes are more important to us. Um, so in, in the in, in the post-COVID year of 2021, the UK saw around one and a half million transactions. So you can see on this chart, it shows UK house sales going back to 2006. Um, so in 2006 and seven, the UK had 1.6 million sales go through. Dropped, up, dropped down to 900,000 in 2008. Property prices fell by 15% in 2008, by the way. Um, and then transaction volumes built up to a level between 2014 and 2019 um, at around 1.2 million. Fell off a cliff in 2020, um, went, um, rose very quickly back up to sort of one and a half million in 2021, and then it normalized to 1.25 million in 2022. So we're forecasting that transaction volumes will be at around a million this year. As I'm okay for time, I'll just put a bit of color around how we arrive at that. So, so you know, we're forecasting that transaction volumes will be around a million this year i think some of our, our peers um may think otherwise and and, and some um, um estate agency chains just don't believe transaction volumes are going to fall at all i don't buy into that i i think sort of you know 10 to 20 percent is about right if th there there is a there's a company that tracks the number of um, properties being sold 
and also the number of properties that fall through before exchange. It's a company called 20CI. They cover lots of different sectors. And, um, and their data is showing that in the first 16 weeks of this year, um, in terms of net property sales, i.e. properties that have been sold subject to contract, less the number that have fallen through. So this is not the number of completions, which is tracked by HMRC. This is real-time data. Um, 20CI is saying that there have been um, 262,000 sales in the, in the 16 weeks um, so far this year. That's that's net sales subject to contract. In, just to give you a comparison, so remember that number, 262,000. To give you a comparison, um, in, in 2017 for the same period, it was 277,000. So it's slightly less than in 2017. In 2021, again, same period, it was 397,500. So you can see that, you know, 2021 was an extraordinary year. Um, the same period last year, it was 330,000 sales subject uh, sold subject to contract net. Um, the first 16 weeks of this year, it's 262. So this is where our 20% comes from. Um, that may change because um, if you annualize that, that takes you takes you to um, 850,000 sales. Um, however, in, in the property market, normally the the June, uh, the, the July, August, September, October, November months are the much bigger months in the year. So, so, it, it, so we can't just annualize that 260,000 it doesn't quite work like that. Um, but, but I, I imagine we'll get to around a million this year and we are sort of sticking to that, aren't we Louise at the moment? Um, we did think at one point it was too pessimistic, you know, we sort of, but you know, you, we, we, we've got some logic around this and we're happy to explain that logic to, uh, to anybody who's, who's interested. Okay. So the, um, on the mortgage market, um, so the on this chart, the grey line, first of all, is the same line as the previous slide. So the grey line shows um, the number of house sales in the UK. So the same line as on the previous slide. The red and the blue um, bars show house purchase mortgages and remortgages. And all, all we're showing is we're showing that house purchase mortgages generally follows the market. So you can see the blue line follows house sales. But the red line, um, house uh, 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 remortgages, sorry, uh, the red line generally does something different. Um, so remortgages now are really picking up because for many years, uh, mortgage holders have not really had a driving reason why they should fix their mortgage rate. You know, rates have been so cheap. Um, but now you've got millions of people who are watching rates very carefully because they've, they've got rates about to come to an end. And, you know, there is there is some sort of good news on that side. Um, you know, I'm one of these people who didn't remortgage um, in Q4 last year. I had a quote from 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 that West, my lender um, in Q4, and I was quoted um, six and a half to seven percent um, in terms of an interest rate. Um, bear in mind that at the moment my mortgage is on two percent. So it's quite a big, you know, big jump. I decided not to do anything. Um, I have now just fixed mine this week um, and I, I secured a rate of three point nine percent through the same lender. In fact, I think it was 3.91. Um, so I just wanted to use that as a real illustration that, you know, in Q4, people were looking down the barrel at, you know, much higher rates. That is now not the case. And I accept that 3.9% on my mortgage is higher than 2%, but it's not 8%. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I think that at that level, um, the market will continue to operate, you know, al almost as normal. Okay. Um, so um, just to wind up this sort of investment case, so I said at the beginning that we've got three parts to our business. You've got residential lettings, um, which is growing every year. It's recurring, it's predictable, and we've got baked in growth, not only from the assisted acquisitions program that we help our franchisees with, but also from rental inflation. That's That represents about 60% of our gross profit. Then you've got a state agency, which I said is is cyclical, um, but there isn't the, you know there, there is no disaster in in the estate agency side of uh, the market. Um, transaction volumes are holding up reasonably well. House prices are holding up reasonably well, and and I suspect that as mortgage rates become cheaper, you know if they do become cheaper over the next eighteen months. Um, that will help to drive growth in the sector. Um, at the weekend, um, the government said they were looking at initiatives to help more people into home ownership. And I think one or two of the house builders share prices reacted quite well on, on the back of that. Um, so what government is suggesting is that after help to buy was scrapped um, earlier in the year, uh, last year, um, that, that something else will, will come along to, to replace that. Um, but we you know that's yet to be confirmed. 
We've also got some changes in sort of regulation coming. You've got the Renters Reform Bill, um, which, which is a bill that we're expecting to see a draft of the bill um, in the next week. That's what the government said um, yesterday. Um, and the Renters Reform Bill will make it slightly more difficult for private landlords to operate. For example, the private landlord will have to give their tenant access to an ombudsman scheme, a free ombudsman scheme, which could result in fines and penalties being made against landlords. I suspect that some landlords, when that happens, will will go off and use an agent. So about half of landlords use an agent, half of landlords don't. Um, so we've got baiting and growth in the private rented sector. A state agency, I accept it's cyclical, but actually, you know, it's holding up um, pretty well. Um, FS, I think, has probably been through the worst um, period. You know, it was a difficult Q4, um, but we are now seeing heightened activity on the financial services side, and we suspect there may be acquisitions in that area. Um, later this year we typically do take on one or two corporate acquisitions each year we haven't taken on any yet um but you know it's um it, it's fairly early in the year um so they're the three sort of areas that we we operate in um franchisees will of course continue to grow and um you know we're looking forward to what we think will be you know another another good year so alex i think i'm just exactly on time um i'm dead on 40 minutes shall we have a go at some of the questions yeah. if um that's brilliant dorian and, and louise thank you for that um clearly tough times for anyone involved in the uh, residential property market but i think you've shown the, the resilience of your of your franchise model so uh, we will now take uh, questions um and just as a reminder if you do want to ask a question please type it into the uh, q a box at the at the bottom of your screen um so we've got sort of 15 20 minutes let's try and crack on us through as many questions as we can so let me start um here how is the group's crm system um can you generate uh, leads between branches to increase group sales or rentals and when customers move into a new area yeah sure so the i think like a lot of um franchise businesses we we've had legacy issues where we've taken on acquisitions they've had different crms and it's all i think in any business it's always a challenge to kind of get um get the business across onto one crm um we are now on so when i say we all of our property franchises bar four offices um, are now on a common crm we've been working very hard on that for the last two years um at one point i thought you know we're never going to quite get over this hill it was like pushing water uphill to get just to get over that hurdle you know such as is the life with, with of it um, but yeah, we've got the franchisees in a common operating system. We already have um, referral arrangements in parts of the business, but later this year, and if you ask me that question again, um, when we see you again, John, maybe sort of September time, um, I can put some more colour around this. But um, we're actually working on a tech solution to um, to automate referrals across our network. Step one was common operating system. Step two is doing more things with that common operating system. And um, that's something that we're looking to launch. An automated way of doing that is something that we, we intend to launch this year. So. OK, thank you. We've had a couple of questions. One came in ahead of time and one's coming today about uh, the size of the acquisitions that you'll be comfortable doing, given the strength of your balance sheet and a comment that, um, you know, you didn't extend the RCF um, in order to reduce costs. Um, so I guess the questions are, you know, how large could you go up to an acquisition and would you consider um, using cash debt only over issuing shares? Um, you know, the business is very cheap. Uh, shame to give away shares at such a low price in order to acquire a new business so i wondered if you could uh, comment on that do you want to go for that one Louise, if you... yeah no, that's fine um i think um whoever said um that this is too cheap and it would be a shame to issue shares is man after all one after my own heart um no i mean our, our funding in we we did we did some acquisitions back in our first couple of acquisitions back in 2015 2016 were um we we raised equity um but in 2016 we did one through half equity half half um debt and since then we've funded all our acquisitions um from cash or debt so because the business is very cash generative we've managed to pay down that facility which was 12 million at its peak um we've managed to pay that down by march this year and continue to invest in new businesses um, over the course of the last few years and that is our preference um to raise equity it's quite, quite expensive and you've got the ongoing cost of the dividend and you've got the dilution of um existing shareholders we'd prefer to buy out of using cash or jet, debt and and improve um everybody's um earnings per share so um, that's how we would look to fund them. I mean, in terms of how large we would go, 
Um, I mean, I'm always quite comfortable if we were to um, borrow something like, you know, two times EBITDA, I think we'd be quite comfortable at that. And so that would take us up to 20 million. Um, I don't think um, there would be any problems with that. Certainly when we have had large amounts of debts before, debt before we have had issues with investors constantly asking questions about it. So it would, if we had a, an acquisition of that sort of size, you know, as a board, we'd have to weigh up, um, you know, investor nervousness around debt and, and obviously our ability to fund it. But with the sort of level of EBITDA we have and how cash generative we are, it would just seem, um, um, it would seem the most obvious thing to fund it through debt. Okay, thank you. I think you've, uh, you've answered all those questions there. Uh, got a question here looking ahead. Um, so looking ahead five years, how would you see the split of your revenues between lettings, financial services and estate agency? Can we do that or do you want to? Yeah, yeah, you, well, yeah, you can do it. Do you know, what I mean? yeah, it's an interesting one. Uh, uh, um, the, I mean, if, if you sort of push financial services to one side for a second, I'll come back to it and just look at our property revenue. Um, it, it's about a sort of 80 20 split across our property revenue of lettings versus estate agency. Um, and then if you overlay sort of financial services, um, that financial services is now 50% of our revenue, but it's only 20 because of the payaways. Um, to mortgage advisors, it's only 20, you know, 20% of our, our gross profit. What I'm kind of coming to is that I, I think it'll probably stay at a, at a similar level because we're helping franchisees to acquire more lettings businesses. And we've done an incredible, I think it's 120, that's more than that now, it's maybe 130 of those acquisitions over, over eight years. Um, and, and there are still plenty of those to go at. Um, the, the estate agency and letting sector is still very much dominated by quite small independent agents, many of whom, you know, reach retirement each year and they want to exit. So we've got plenty of um, acquisition possibilities on the franchisee side that will help grow the rental part of the business. Um, on a state agency, um, we've got opportunities to acquire either small networks or to help the estate agency franchisees get involved in in other things um, like FS and like letting. So we, um, yeah, we we you know we I I think the bottom line is, and and I suppose FS is the only bit I've missed out. Um, we think this year there probably will be opportunities on the FS side to to you know buy a couple of small businesses similar to the ones that we've done before, but at a lower multiple than last year. So that so we we we're going to be quite opportunistic, I think, this year. Um, we have, you know, we've got opportunities in each part of the business if we if we want to go for them. Um, and I say, you know, watch this space. I think we'll probably end up doing, you know, as we do every year, we'll probably end up doing, you know, one one or two deals. So I think about the same. Okay, thank you. Uh, going back to the M and A side of things, are there any geographical gaps that you'd like to uh, like to fill in? Yeah, there is. I mean, the, the biggest and most obvious one is London. Um, you know, we, we've we um, so if, if, if more than 90 percent of our franchisee revenue comes from outside of the M25, it's clearly, a, you know, an opportunity for us. And, and you know, it's a strength and it's a weakness. Um, I think that we, we don't really have the appetite to grow organically from a standing start in London because the cost will just be too much. Um, and you've got to find the right franchisees and, you know, there's, there's risk in it. Um, but there are franchised um, property businesses in London that we like. We like their brand. They've got, you know, long histories and, you know, very successful. So the bottom line is, Alex, I think we would, you know, if, if we're going to extend into London, I think we do it mainly by acquisition of a property franchise. Okay, great. Yeah, and the spin-off business from acquiring that business um, is FS, which we've already got the infrastructure for. Yeah. Okay. Got a couple of questions on the same topic here. So I'm going to ask them together. And it's, it's about one of your competitors, um, the news that, that LSL is going to be franchising their entire um, estate agency network. And would you be able to just comment on your thoughts about that and maybe the impact it might have on the sector and, and perhaps the Belvoir business? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it'll have no impact on the sector at all. I think that's the easiest part to, to answer because they're, you know, it's corporately owned estate agents who, who are now being sort of franchised out. So I don't think it'll have any impact on the wider sector. Um, I think it's a good move. But for LSL, I must admit, I think their share price has reacted, you know, quite well um, to, to the news this morning. Um, and, and what you know, just to explain what, why I think that, um, I personally feel that a, that a franchisee or, or an owner of, of an estate agency or lettings business will always outperform a paid branch manager on almost every occasion. Not every occasion, because there are some brilliant branch managers 
um, who no matter what happens in the local market, they just always do really well and they're competitive and, you know, they're at work at seven o'clock in the morning. But then you've, you've got, I'd say the, the most paid managers will just do what they're being paid to do, very different to a franchisee. So I think for, for, from, 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 from a franchising point of view, I think it's an enormous tick in the box for franchising. You know, it, it clearly says that corporate operations aren't as effective as franchising otherwise why would they have, have taken that route and, and i actually think the offices will do quite well as a result i think um the, the only the only thing I would, I would say to caveat that alex is that um as i understand it and i could be wrong they're, they're taking existing sort of management teams and branch managers and sort of they're, they're becoming franchisees that there's always an inherent risk in that because you know you, you're banking on the facts of someone you're banking on someone's ability to go from an employee to a business person and that you know we've done that over the years a number of times and it sometimes works but it sometimes doesn't um you know some people have all, will always have an employee mentality and when they become a business person and they've got to worry about cash flow and vat and everything and staff management and everything else that comes with it that actually doesn't have any a good impact on the individual so that you know they've, they've become less effective so i think that's the only area of um that, you know to watch but i think overall um, you know, it's it, it's a kudos for franchising, really. Okay, thank you for that. Got a specific question here on the line item in the PL. What's the cost of the group PL central overhead? One and a half million. Um, but it's um, you know, it, it all depends on what people think that that should be included in that. But certainly, um, the the cost that remains in the if you like the PLC company and doesn't get recharged out to other parts of the business is about one and a half million. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of interest in, in the acquisition side. So we're going back to this again. Assuming uh, Belvar makes an acquisition this year, in, in which area do you anticipate this is likely to be financial services, lettings or sales? Or will it depend purely on what opportunities arise? I saw I saw John's question coming up as well. Hi, John. <clears throat> um, do you know I, I would have said that um, we we that we've de we there are definitely opportunities on on all three. Um, definitely, I mean we are, you know we are, we are putting ourselves out there in terms of looking for um, you know decent sort of property acquisitions. I actually think that I think franchisee acquisitions will have will perform better this year than last year. I think there's a chance we could get to. If last year we brought on just under four million of revenue, franchisee revenue, which then translated into royalties. But let's say we brought on just under four million last year. Um, I suspect we'll do five to six million this year, John, on, on franchisee acquisitions. I, I also and then to answer your question on the corporate stuff, I think the next acquisitions will probably be in the FS space, I I, I imagine, um, but smaller ones. Um, but we do have you know property um opportunities that we that we, you know, we, we're looking at as well. So, so we've got opportunities on the point being, we've got opportunities on all sides. Um, the franchisee ones are going particularly well at the minute because we had a good start to work, a good start to the year. Um, but I say, I watch this space for corporate acquisitions because we normally, you know, we normally do do some in a year. Good. And as a follow on the question, what's the short term target for the number of agency offices offering uh, financial services? Yes, that's, that's a good question in that, um, you know, I, I think we have, um, you can argue that we have failed, Alex, to, to overlay our, our financial services business with our property franchises. You can argue we've either failed at it or you can argue it's a it's an opportunity and I'll let you, you decide. Um, what I'm coming to is that um, in our financial services business, um, only about 10% of the revenue that we're currently generating is coming from our franchisees. So 90% is coming from other lead sources, which... In, in in some ways that that adds strength to the model because it doesn't it just means that we're not entirely reliant on our on our property business so that is definitely a strength but it's also an opportunity because we want more franchisees involved in in um in fs um why there haven't been as many franchisees getting involved i think is simply because the market's been pretty good you know in 2021 and 2022 um and franchisees have just ch chased the bigger ticket items i think it's almost as you know if, if anybody, ever, anybody ever asks a franchisee i imagine that's the answer that um that they'll give okay great and again on the, on the acquisition side are, are there more opportunities to work with contractors and charge commissions on maintenance and repair works uh, that they carry out for the group and a comment here that says leaders roman group have an in-house contractor could this be considered on the acquisition side 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's an interesting question from Joseph in, in that, um, you know, as a group, we we don't have um, um, any revenue. We don't have a revenue line that comes from contractors. Um, our franchisees may charge um, contractor commission, you know, and which is fine as long as the landlords know, you know, for, for example, um, if so, I'm a landlord and if my agent said to me, look, you've got to replace your bathroom this year, it's 15 years old. Um, I'm going to have to manage that process for you. And it's not like repairing a boiler where, you know, I can do it in two or three, you know, a couple of visits. This is a management process that will go on for a month or two or three. Um, I would happily pay a management fee for that to be done. The alternative is that I get in my car and I do it myself. You know, so, I'd, you know, I'm quite happy to pay someone for that. So it's fine to do it. Um, we just don't do it at group level. The franchisees do it. And then I guess that does feed into our revenue because we get, you know, royalties on franchisees revenue. Um, you know, we, we, we've we looked at um, sort of having maybe centralised contractors. I'm, I, I might change my view over time. My personal view as a landlord is that if, if a company tries to use a national um, provider for, for maintenance work, the national provider, by virtue of the fact that they've got vans and people and employees and, and the national, normally charge more than local contractors. The challenge with the local contractor is if, if Alex's um, boiler breaks down tomorrow and Alex calls, you know, a number of plumbers, they'll say, sorry, Gov, can't get out to you for a couple of weeks, maybe three, you know, but it's not calls. You know, I'll give you a shout. And to, you know, it's very difficult to get individual contractors to come out and do work. Um, if I take our office that we own in Grantham, for example, we manage 450 properties in Grantham. That's a huge amount of work for local contractors. So when we call them and we say we've got a job, they say, yep, I'll make time for you. And being able to offer that level of service to a client, I think, is invaluable. You know, that's part and parcel of the of the value that we bring to agents. I'm not I haven't yet been convinced that trying to centralize that is better for the client. Um, but, you know, I'll I'll. I'll, I'll I'll keep looking at it. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we're, we're coming to the end now. And apologies, we won't be able to answer all the questions, but we've we've got a couple which I'm going to group together, which are on capital allocation. Um, and and the questions are: Are you considering share buybacks? And could you comment about the strategy for dividend progression? If I just cover on the on the share buybacks, it's one that's come up more in recent times, particularly this year, because we're now. Um, we're in a net cash position and we've been, we are very cash generative. I think my answer on that one, we, we have discussed it as a board and we do consider it, but we'll consider it, you know, in more earnest when we feel that there is nothing that we've got um, a better purpose for the cash. I think it's something we would do, but in the, but only in the absence of, you know, of a, of a better investment story for the money, really. Um, and in terms of the shares, you know, in our broker's note, we've got, it, it, it's going up by a sort of half of, Hence each year, but I mean we are going to review it and um, and look at um, whether there's scope for doing a little bit more going forwards on the increase. Um, but yeah, um, and broadly our principle has been is to be to um, our strategy has been to pay out half of our retained earnings as a dividend. Brilliant, thank you. As you've answered that so succinctly, Louise, I'm going to ask one more question, which has come up, which is. How have you or would you ever consider acquiring any of your franchisee companies? Oh, in fact, the franchisees. So just to be careful on the wording, because the, the um, you know, into, most people say to us, you know, would you consider buying some of the other franchisors? That's another question here. You know, would we look at, I don't know, or any of the listed uh, property franchisors? The answer is, of course, yes to that. To that, We would, of course, look at any of the listed sort of property franchisors if there was ever, you know, an opportunity um, have we ever considered uh, acquiring our franchisees? No, uh, we sort of considered it. And we we do run two offices uh, ourselves. In fact, we've got three with a Humphreys office, but we normally run a couple ourselves. Um, you know, our principle and what stands behind our business is that is, is franchising. You know, at, at our core, we are a franchise business. We don't want to become a corporate business. Um, and you can see with LSL making their decision to move away from corporate agency that franchising, I think, is the best is the best route and um, somebody else asked whether roper was still in the works alex as well what roper is is regulation of property agents um interestingly a government minister tweeted yesterday i think it was michael gove said that the um the renters reform bill the draft bill is going to be out in the next week so they so they say but um and that's quite an interesting one because we we think that will drive more landlords to agents but if if you if you if you will get to sort of a, a minute at some point have a have a google for renters reform bill that's what's due out this week and that's what contains 
um, requirement for an ombudsman, banning of Section 21. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there that um, I wouldn't read all the detail, but if you read the headline, it, it, it does make sense, or it should make sense. Well, thank you, Dorian, for uh, picking up on those uh, extra couple of questions there, but I'm afraid mm -hmm. we are now out of time. I would like to just say thank you uh, to Dorian and to Louise uh, for presenting so clearly and answering those questions. Uh, thank you to um, everyone for attending. Um, and I would ask you, if you leave today or when you leave today, would you mind uh, completing the feedback form? I know management uh, do appreciate that. It will only take a, a, a couple of uh, couple of minutes and just to flag up a couple of uh, future webinars that we have coming up. So the next one, 9th of May, Capita, 22nd of May, Sainsbury's, uh, 6th of June, Hercules Site Services, and on the 19th of June, Casting. So thank you again for attending and we hope to see you all soon.